Hello everyone, it's me, your average bonehead, Jay. And since I just got done talking about the mediocre Last Airbender, well, we actually talk about the good one. Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the greatest shows of all time, a reputation it's clearly earned, as it manages to have great characters, story, development, and world, all while being a funny cartoon show for the whole family to enjoy. There really isn't that many shows like it, and you can see that even the best like to follow in its footsteps. So to give the show the respect that it deserves, because the people who run things clearly aren't, I thought it'd be fun to rank my top 11 favorite episodes from this show. Being a show with three seasons, making a total of 61 episodes, and a whopping zero of them being actually bad, this list was actually surprisingly easy for me to figure out which episodes I liked the most. Now, of course, a few things to note. One, as all my lists are, this is solely opinion-based, nothing I say here is objective, despite my wording. Two, spoilers everywhere. And three, the reason why this list is a top 11 and not a top 10 is because despite knowing the ranking for this list, I still couldn't narrow down it to just being 10 episodes that I wanted to talk about. So, it's going to be 11. Now, without further ado, this is the top 11 best Avatar The Last Airbender episodes. Number 11. My first girlfriend turned into the moon. That's rough, buddy. The Boiling Rock. Of all the life-changing field trips with Zuko, I'm glad the one they made the two-parter was the good old-fashioned prison break, because my god does a lot of things happen in these two episodes. Sokka, feeling guilty for the failure of the invasion plan during the eclipse, convinces Zuko to take him to a Fire Nation maximum security prison, known as the Boiling Rock, as so Sokka can break his father out of prison. The two manage to sneak in, but unfortunately, he's not there. But the good news is, Suki is. Also on a side note, I just realized that Suki has been rotting in this prison basically since the halfway point of season 2. This girl really got the short end of the stick. But while crafting an escape plan, not only does Zuko get found out and arrested, but some of the other prisoners get involved with the escape plan. And on top of that, Sokka, Zuko, and Suki end up having to stay when they end up hearing that a new shipment of prisoners is coming that could contain Sokka's father. And luckily it does. That was all part one by the way. Some fans don't like part one all too much as they say it's not really necessary, but trust me, considering part two, it is extremely necessary. Part 2 has Sokka reuniting with his dad, Zuko and Mei's relationship being viciously challenged, and one hell of a prison riot where they end up having to kidnap the warden. And that's when it clicks to you, wait, if Mei's here, that means Azula and Tai Li are also here. Leading to one hell of an intense battle of Zuko, Sokka, and Suki fighting against Azula and Tai Li on a gondola suspended above a boiling lake. And goddamn, Azula's like a machine. But on top of that, I do like the character moments featured in this episode. Like around here, where Zuko and Mei are arguing, and Zuko ends up saying this. But I have to do this to save my country. Save it? You're betraying your country. That's not how I see it. Notice how Mei doesn't say anything back to him. Like a part of her fully understands why Zuko is doing what he's doing. Which ultimately leads to Mei and Tai Li betraying Azula at the ending. Between the good character moments and the tense suspension, both figuratively and literally, this two-parter was a good field trip to get your blood boiling. Number 10. My stomach is so empty that it's making me tear bend! <laughs> the Ember Island Players. Come on, I gotta be allowed one shit post on this list. Though, to be fair, I don't think anyone actually dislikes this episode, as quite possibly one of the most famous filler episodes ever, this episode has the task of being the series recap, since it is the episode right before the finale. And as many people are aware, it did more than just succeed at that. Because the plot is, the gang decides that they want to go and watch a play that's based on them. Said play being an exaggerated retelling of all of their past adventures. That also doubles as foreshadowing to the final battle and Fire Nation propaganda. On top of that, the play is of course hilarious, being an in-universe parody of the show, with the characters all being exaggerated. I release a sonic wave from my mouth. and even down to making fun of the shipping wars. There are a few character moments of the characters reacting to what they saw, my favorite of them being this little moment between Toph and Zuko. Ow! What was that for? That's how I show affection. Also leading to possibly my favorite Zuko line. But your scar's on the wrong side. The scar's not on the wrong side! 
But other than that, it's mainly just them and us just watching the play. But I have to applaud them for how consistently funny and surreal it is the whole way through. And on top of that, I like the little in-jokes that some people didn't catch on to. Like, the reason why Aang is played by a woman in this play is because he was voiced by one in the pilot. And the reason why Toph is this big, strong man is because, originally, that's how she was conceptualized before they decided to make her the character we all know and love today. So, there's not much more I can say about this episode other than it's a great showstopper. Number 9. Your champion, the Blind Bandit! The Blind Bandit. Okay, I'm gonna be real with you all. The only reason why this episode is on this list is because it introduces my favorite character, Toph. Sounds to me like you're scared, Boulder. Yep, not counting any of the foreshadowing, this episode was her grand introduction. Aang, still looking for an earthbending teacher, ends up going to an earthbending competition to try and seek out a master. And after viewing a laundry list of potential candidates, including the icon of The Boulder's gonna win this in a landslide. He ends up seeing someone who resembles a vision he had in an earlier episode. A little blind girl named Toph, who goes by the stage name of the Blind Bandit, who also happens to be the champion. After some investigation, it turns out she's the hidden daughter of the Beifong family, and Aang ends up trying to recruit her onto the team. After some funny shenanigans, Toph and Aang seem to quickly hit it off and become good friends, as Toph ends up explaining that despite being completely blind, she can still technically see by using her earthbending which also explains why she's so good at it. But unfortunately, due to her overprotective parents, she feels like she has to hide this. But before anything can be resolved, some of the earthbenders from earlier feel like they were being scammed by Aang and Toph, ends up kidnapping the two. Though it doesn't end up taking long for Toph, in front of her overbearing father, to quickly lay waste to these guys. Which ultimately results in Toph being able to join Aang and the gang on their adventure. Even though her father doesn't approve. I want you to do whatever it takes to bring her home. Obviously, the star of this episode is Toph, and the reason why she's one of my favorite characters ever is because of the message that this episode, and Toph in general, presents. Toph is completely blind, but she doesn't let that stop her as she uses her earthbending to see, which allowed her to become very, very good at it. Her whole existence is a great message for people with disabilities, basically saying that you shouldn't let them stop you from trying to accomplish what you want in life. And I think that's a good message for anyone to look up to. On top of all of that though, this episode also just has the funny moments of Sokka with his bag and belt. Now I'm really glad I bought this bag. It matches the belt perfectly. That is a big relief. But overall, it was a good thing Toph's stage name was the Blind Bandit because she managed to definitely steal all of our hearts. Number 8. We will have control of the Fire Nation capital, and this war will be over. The Day of Black Sun. The Infinity Wars of the whole series, as it's one of the biggest battles the show has ever had with just the amount of characters that are in it. As we basically see almost everyone who's ever appeared in the show show up for this one huge invasion to try and take down the Fire Nation, as it's the Day of the Eclipse, an event that was built up since the halfway point of the last season, all due to the fact that once the eclipse is going on, all firebenders will lose their bending. So yeah, this is a big moment, and it leads to a pretty epic battle. There's just one itty bitty problem. When Aang goes to confront the Fire Lord, nobody's home. Due to the fact that Azula found out about the whole thing back in Season 2, the Fire Nation had more than enough time to prepare for the eclipse and were just biding their time to lure everyone into a trap. But luckily, Aang, Toph, and Sokka end up figuring out where the Fire Lord could be, and while they go to confront him while they still have time, they only run into Azula, who, god damn it, I told you she's a machine because she's even good without her bending. And if you think that's good, we also really get to see her silver tongue. My favorite prisoner used to mention you all the time. She was convinced you were going to come rescue her. Of course, you never came. Where is Suki? That is just messed up. So yeah, because of that, they end up missing their one chance to defeat the Fire Lord while he would possibly be in a weakened state. And they have no choice but to retreat. But of course, the Fire Nation had plans for that too, 
as they manage to destroy our hero's only main method of transportation, making it so our young heroes have to escape on Appa, leaving all the adults to be forced to surrender. In my eyes, this episode is so great because it is the best way of doing satisfying disappointment. In a way, I think we all knew in the back of our heads there was no way this invasion was going to be successful, but we all really, really hoped with the amount of people that came to fight that they would be able to succeed. But unfortunately, that's not how life goes. But for one glimmer of positivity, the biggest twist happens. Zuko betrays his father to join the Avatar. But I've come to an even more important decision. I'm going to join the Avatar, and I'm going to help him defeat you. On a side note, I love Zuko and Ozai's confrontation. Everything is just so tense during it, and I especially love how the second Ozai gets his bending back, he immediately goes for the kill on Zuko. Like I said, intense. So I guess all that's left for me to say is much like any eclipse, it may be awesome to look at, but don't do it for too long. It might be blinding. Number 7. How could you do this to me? You betrayed me! You brought this on yourself. I had no choice. The Runaway. This is a pretty simple episode for the most part, all things considered. It's about Toph, Aang, and Sokka scamming this Fire Nation town in order to get a lot of money, which is something they're always short on. And Toph can easily pull this off by secretly using her earthbending. Of course, Katara is warning them that this could be potentially dangerous, resulting in her becoming a wanted criminal known as the Runaway. So that's why it's called that. First off, this episode is hilarious, from moments like the montage of Toph pulling off all these scams, to Sokka getting a bird, to the many moments where they forget that Toph is blind. I found something that you're not gonna like. Well, it sounds like a sheet of paper, but I guess you're referring to what's on the sheet of paper. What's this? I don't know! I mean, seriously, what's with you people? I'm blind! And especially this moment where we see Aang and Sokka's 10 million IQ when they're together. I can't believe we forgot Toph can't write. Yep, we're idiots. This is a really fun episode, but that's not why I placed it as high as I did. The reason why I like this episode so much is this one scene. After Katara and Toph explode at each other, Sokka ends up talking to Toph privately, not knowing that Katara can hear them. And we get this moment. When our mom died, that was the hardest time in my life. Our family was a mess. But Katara, she had so much strength. She's always been the one that's there. And now, when I try to remember my mom, Katara's is the only face I can picture. She's compassionate and kind, and she actually cares about me. You know, the real me. And this is why I believe this line from Katara, You act like you hate them, but you don't. You just feel guilty. To be true. Toph needs some form of parental guidance, but she needs it from someone who actually understands her. Remember, she was heavily watched over, but it was always by the guards, not really by her parents. In fact, once her parents found out that she was a great earthbender, their immediate reaction was to double her security. Katara knows Toph needs guidance, but at the same time, she knows she's capable. And I think, honestly, that's what frustrates her more. I'd say, if anything, this episode really shows the sister dynamic between Katara and Toph, which is why I rank it so high. It also has fun moments of the two of them trying to pull off a scam and all of them having to end up escaping Sparky Sparky Boom Man. But bottom line, this is proof that all it takes is one scene in an episode to really make an impact. Number 6. The Guru and the Crossroads of Destiny. The best way I can describe the Season 2 finale is it's the Empire Strikes Back of Avatar, and of course I mean that as a compliment. This two-parter perfectly shows the light being consumed by the darkness. What I mean by that is in Part 1, The Guru, everything seems to be going pretty well for our main heroes. Even Zuko is happy, owning a tea shop with his uncle. So Aang goes off to meet a guru who can teach him how to master the Avatar state. Unfortunately, while he's gone, Azula, as well as Mei and Tai Li, break into Ba Sing Se, disguised as Kyoshi warriors. And within the span of a few days, we see how Azula is quickly able to completely take over Ba Sing Se. I always kind of find it funny that her mission was to get Zuko and Iroh. She just chose to take over Ba Sing Se while she was there. And it's not long before Katara is taken out. And at the same time, Toph was kidnapped to be taken back home to her parents. Like I said before, the Guru is a 
perfect balance between the light and the dark. Seeing the spiritual side with Aang learning how to master the Avatar state, intertwined with moments where we cut back to bossing Say and seeing everything go wrong. And much like The Empire Strikes Back, it even ends with our hero seeing a vision of his friends in danger and having to leave his training to go and help them. The rising tensions of this episode just keep you on the edge of your seat, all topping off with Toph inventing metal bending. The Guru on its own guaranteed it a spot, but it was part two, The Crossroads of Destiny, that really solidified it being this high on the list. Aang, Sokka, and Toph return to bossing Say right as Azula puts her plan into action, so the three have no choice but to team up with Iroh to rescue Katara and Zuko, which of course leads to some great action and unique team-ups. But of course, I also love this line from Azula. You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. God damn, this 14-year-old girl, yes, she's 14, the same age as Luce and Steven, is scary. We really see how manipulative Azula can be, because right when it looks like Zuko, after showing that he's finally been happy and having a nice moment with Katara that is just there for friendship, you fools, it looks like Zuko will actually be on our side, only for him to not only betray all the good things happening to him, but betray his uncle because Azula promised him his honor back. That look from Iroh says it all. And on top of all of that failure and heartbreak, Aang was told in the Guru if he dies in the Avatar state, the Avatar will not be reborn. And guess what Azula does? Yes, that was a 12 year old boy dying in a Nickelodeon show for families. God damn Azula is evil. Obviously Katara revives him, but still. Seeing the lightness from the Guru be completely consumed by this episode's darkness it's just one hell of a rush. Now that's how you do a good end of season cliffhanger. Number five. She was protecting the last waterbender. What? Who? Me! The Southern Raiders. This episode in a family show tackles the relatively mature subject matter of cold-blooded revenge. Emphasis on cold-blooded. After managing to escape Zula and her amazing one-liners, I am about to celebrate becoming an only child! We see Zuko still trying to make amends with Katara, but she still doesn't like him due to his betrayal back at the ending of season two. So after the funniest, most risque joke this show's ever done, Well, hello! Zuko decides to give Katara the one thing she always, or at least thinks she always wanted. Revenge. The two managed to track down who they think killed Katara's mother all those years ago, the leader of the Southern Raiders. And when they think they found him, Katara is so blinded by rage she what? blood bends the guy without hesitation. There was an entire episode showing that she hated doing that, and she does it here without a second thought. But they end up figuring out that this is not the right guy. Turns out the actual man who did it is a sad, pathetic, old man who lives with his mother. And when I say he's pathetic, I mean he's pathetic. When Katara finally confronts him, he flat out just says, I did a bad thing. I know I did. And you deserve revenge. So why don't you take my mother? That would be fair. This whole episode just radiates with uneasiness, and it makes sense considering the relatively dark subject matter, which I think, this late in the game for the show, is a good thing for it to do. The animation and voice acting is also pristine in this episode, but my favorite part of this episode actually is its message. Obviously, Katara doesn't kill the guy or his mother, but she also doesn't forgive him. But I didn't forgive him. I'll never forgive him. And I love that. It's the perfect message of just because someone did something absolutely horrible to you doesn't mean you have to bring yourself down to their level in order to move on. I absolutely adore that. And I think using Katara's tragic backstory of losing her mother was the perfect way to vessel this message. The perfect episode to send chills down your spine. Number four. While it is always best to believe in oneself, a little help from others can be a great blessing. Tales of Ba Sing Se. 
This is a rather interesting episode as it's the series' only anthology, as in a bunch of plots that don't really have any major meaning aside from being kind of tangentially related. As you would assume from the title, they're all related due to the fact that they all happen relatively around the same time while all our main characters are in Ba Sing Se. But what also makes this episode strange is because, while it's a very popular episode, and for obvious reasons, the stories in it are kind of simple and don't really progress the overall plot that much. But it's what's in these stories, especially one of them, or, well, two for me, is what makes me love this episode so much. Going in no particular order, Sokka's plot is about him getting in a haiku rap battle in order to impress the ladies, and yes, that is as funny as it sounds. Zuko's story is about him going on a date. As hilariously adorable and awkward this all is, I don't know why, I feel like I can sense Mei shooting daggers at him for this, both figuratively and definitely literally. Aang's plot is about him helping out a zookeeper to try and get a bigger space for his animals, and of course causing a ruckus everywhere. My cap! Oh, forget it! Don't worry, it all works out in the end. Momo's plot is the one that definitely progresses the plot the most. It's about him still looking for Appa, and ultimately tagging along with these other creatures that end up trying to eat him, but end up taking a liking to him after Momo saves them, and they show Momo that Appa is somewhere in the city. But if we're going over my two favorite stories, first is the one of Toph and Katara, and it's about the two going out and having a relaxing spa day together. Aside from this one being funny and really showcasing these two sister bond, I like it for what Toph says here after the duo swiftly deal with a bunch of girls that were making fun of them. Is that I don't have to waste my time worrying about appearances. I don't care what I look like. I'm not looking for anyone's approval. I know who I am. Moments like that just continue on for what I've said earlier in this video of why Toph is my favorite. But of course, everyone knows the real reason why this episode is so high up, and that's for Iroh's story. For the most part, it's just a lighthearted story of him going around gathering things for what looks like a personal celebration of some sort, and just the mishaps he runs into along the way. I mean, a guy tries to mug him, and he responds by giving him tea and life advice. So everything's fine and dandy until the episode jump scares you with an emotional gut punch at the ending as you realize what he was getting ready for. Iroh is getting ready for the anniversary of losing his son. For some reason, recently, Iroh's kind of been under fire by some people, saying that he doesn't deserve all the praise he gets from the fandom because of the horrible things he did as a war general. But guys, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but I'm pretty sure Iroh's aware of the atrocities he committed. The whole point is that Iroh was just as brainwashed as everyone else in the Fire Nation until he ended up losing his son, a punishment dealt to him he could never take back. It was only then where Iroh woke up and realized the horrors he was causing to everyone else when it finally happened to him. Iroh doesn't strike me as the type of character who believes that he deserves forgiveness for what he has done. Hence why he spends the rest of his days consistently trying to undo all his past mistakes. And why he tries so hard to guide the one other person who fills the void of being the closest thing to a son to him, Zuko, and tries to keep him on the right path so that would never happen to him. And if somehow you couldn't figure all of that out just by watching this episode, then I'm sorry this show for 12 year olds is too complicated for you. Number 3 Who does Zuko think he is? Do you really want to know? The Storm. What more can I add? No, seriously. What can I add? Everyone knows this one. Everyone loves this one. In this episode, during a raging storm, we get the backstories of both Aang and Zuko. We learn that after they told Aang he was the Avatar, a bunch of the other younger air nomads that used to be his friends kind of stopped hanging out with him that much, and even more so, that Aang was going to be taken away from his guardian, Monkey Atso, 
and sent away the master elements as quickly as possible as whispers of a war was coming. But being a kid, Aang could not take the responsibility and ran away, getting lost in the storm and freezing himself for a hundred years. On Zuko's side of the story, we see that he was a well-meaning prince who dared criticize the crazy ideas of a general who said they should send their own men on a suicide mission. So, Zuko was forced to battle in an Agni Kai. But what he didn't know is it wasn't the general he disgraced, it was his father. Feeling ashamed, Zuko refused to fight his own father, so Ozai burnt half his face and banished him with the impossible task of finding the Avatar. And yeah, both stories equally tragic, but I think what I love about this episode the most is that we learn these stories at the same time. Despite them taking place almost a century apart from each other, we see how intertwined and similar they are. And in just the span of 22 minutes, we now know the complete history of our main protagonist and our main antagonist. And why and how these two feel isolated and alone, despite the people around them with one choosing to hide behind his naivete and the other choosing to hide behind his anger. But I think what I love most about these stories happening at the same time is that it cleverly foreshadows that these two will inevitably become friends, especially this scene at the ending where they look at each other. You can tell there's a connection there that maybe even they don't know it, but we know it. But other than that, there is not much more I can add to this episode that everyone else hasn't already said. It's the storm. It's season one's best episode. Number two. It's time you learned my history with Fire Lord Sozin. You need to understand how the war began if you want to know how to end it. The Avatar and the Fire Lord. This is an episode I weirdly don't see many people talk about, which is weird because it's basically a sequel to The Storm two seasons later. In this episode, Aang and Zuko end up learning the stories of Avatar Roku and Fire Lord Sozin. And they, along with us, end up learning that those two used to be the bestest of friends, who basically shared everything together and were always looking out for one another. However, things took a turn for the worse after Roku left to train to become the Avatar, and Sozin ended up coming up with an idea to spread the Fire Nation to unite all the other nations with it. And we also see their first and final confrontation, as we see how Roku tried and failed to properly defeat Sozin, which ended up pushing his burden onto a 12-year-old boy. And we also see how Sozin betrayed Roku, leaving him for dead on an erupting volcano. Seeing how this whole war all started really puts it all into perspective if you ask me, and one thing that I love is the characterization of Sozin. I like that he wasn't born a monster. In fact, his original plans didn't even seem to first originate from a sense of malice. It seemed that he was genuinely thinking that the Fire Nation could help the world. The problem was he allowed his ambitions to turn into a lust for power and go out of control, which is what led him to doing such horrible deeds. But the part I love the most is the ending of the story. At the beginning of the episode, Azula tells Zuko this about Sozin. In the end, he died a very old and successful man. But how did he die? Didn't you pay any attention in school, Zuko? He died peacefully. Only for Sozin's own words to contradict it at the ending. I wasted the remainder of my life searching in vain. Which is kind of funny when you think back to how Zuko and Aang first started off, with Zuko aimlessly hunting him down. If anything, Aang and Zuko's friendship is Roku and Sozin's in reverse. Now that's what I call one hell of a parallel. Number one. Since beginningless time, darkness thrives in the void, but always yields to purify light. Sozin's Comet. Yeah, 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 I know, it's kind of obvious that I would put the four-part series finale as the best episode, but that's the thing, it's the four-part series finale, how could it not be the best? I think this is one of the most satisfying conclusions to any show ever. Almost everything gets a conclusion here. Aang having one more epic spirit journey, seeing a bunch of old faces again, Zuko's heartfelt reunion with his uncle, all of that on its own is already beautiful, but it's made even better with the build-up to the epic climax. Sokka, Toph, and Suki going on one hell of a mission to stop the airships, the White Lotus liberating Ba Sing Se, and of course the two epic final battles of Zuko and Katara versus Azula and Aang versus Ozai. I love the final showdown of Zuko and Katara against Azula. Just seeing how unhinged 
unhinged Azula has become, it honestly makes me feel for her. But she did cheat, causing Zuko to almost die, sacrificing himself. So she kind of gets what she deserves, and I love the way Katara did it. But on top of that, the final showdown between Aang and Ozai was great. Just seeing Aang having all that raw power, but ultimately choosing to not kill the Fire Lord. And instead, coming up with a new way, by taking away his bending, making him completely powerless. Now I've seen some people complain about this ending, saying it's a deus ex machina, and... Eh, technically, technically not. I do think they could have foreshadowed energy bending a bit better, but if any of you genuinely think that the solution to this problem should have been Aang killing the Fire Lord, then you guys were not paying attention to any of this show's three seasons that hammered in that Aang doesn't like doing that. Aang should not have to sacrifice what makes him him, as well as the way of his people, in order to save the day. So yes, I do think the way Aang saved the day was immensely satisfying. But even more satisfying is just the ending in general, seeing all these characters come together to celebrate and all of them finally getting the happy ending they all deserve. It is great. And honestly, in my eyes, one of the best series finales ever. Even with some of my all-time favorite shows, I still find some of their series finales to still kind of leave a bit to be desired, no matter how satisfying they were. But not this one. It ties up almost every loose end, but still leaving just enough loose to show that even though this adventure's over, the story of our heroes is far from it. Why are you really here? Because you're going to tell me something. Where is my mother? What more can I say? It's an amazing finale to an amazing series. So, that's my list. Love it? Hate it? Think I deserve a scar like Zuko because of my choices? Well, then feel free to let me know in the comments. Now, I'm your average bonehead Jay, and I wish you all good night. Oh, you're still here. Well, since you stuck around for this long, you might as well like and subscribe. Comment if you're feeling really daring. And while you're at it, you might as well follow me on Twitter and Instagram at jskeleton. Links down below. And if you just want to see more, you can check out the playlist or look at my last video. Now thanks for watching, and if you need me, I'm going back to bed.